All right, folks, welcome to the show. We're going to talk today about the realism of Top Gun. I went to see the movie. I was very impressed with what I saw and a lot of things that I felt they did a good job of, of showing realism, exactly how it's done, and I want to pass that on to you. Folks who want to know more, want to learn more about the show, want to learn more about the fighter pilot, the experience flying fighters, and so I want to talk to you about that. So today my name is Merrill Fink. I'm an, a veteran, 20-year Air Force, flew the F-16 Taught in the Air Force Weapons School, which is the Air Force version, if you will, of Top Gun and also combat experience. So, and I just enjoy talking to you about this. Want to bring this to you and teach you a little bit more about what you're seeing in the movie. I was really impressed with what they've done with it and how they were able to put a lot of realism into it. And I think there's so much information in there. I want to pass that along to you and the fans that are sort of wanting more can learn more about this. There's a lot of information to pass. So um, what I've done is not, I don't want to make this show ever really a criticism of the movie. What I want to do is emphasize what they've done, probably why they've done it that way, and mostly get into what you've seen that's real and explain more about it, what you're looking at. It's never to be a criticism necessarily. It's just pointing out where they may have done things for movie purposes and what you're seeing and the history behind it or what you're really looking at. Tom Cruise said he wanted to celebrate the fighter pilot. That's what this show is about. That's my intention. Today, the goal is to just talk through this movie trailer. So it's a very short trailer, and I'm just going to hit some highlights of some things that I know you'll be interested in. I think about six or seven stops along the way and let the trailer play, and I'll explain and talk along the way. So here we go. Without further ado, we're going to get into low-level flying here. What's going on is this is a 30 feet low level. This is not the kind of thing we typically do in military aviation. It's a little bit lower than we typically fly. Flying this low can get you grounded. You can get in big trouble doing this. So they had a lot of leeway with the movie, obviously. They were able to do some things that we just typically don't do on a daily basis. Uh, We do fly low. And it really depends on what you're doing. But for the most part, low-level flying has kind of gone out of vogue, if you will. They did it in this movie. I get why. It's just more cinematically pleasing. It's more exciting. It provides a little bit more constant realism and a threat of hitting the ground. And so a lot of those kinds of things add into it. And I think they did a good job of bringing why they're doing it into the story. Another thing about low-level flying is... Because it's so much fun, I really think low-level flying started about five hours after the Wright brothers figured out they could fly this plane more than a few hundred yards. They then wanted to go, whose house are we going to go fly over? Or how are we going to fly over each other? And just the fun of it, I think, kicked off probably not far after they built the airplane and got that thing going somewhat reliably. That tradition has continued. It is exciting to be that low it can be very busy and intense and be actually quite dangerous so for that reason and a lot of reasons we don't do it that much anymore as a tactic or a thing in the military there's a lot of reasons for that the technology being able to do it other ways but that's not really cinematically pleasing that's not very exciting to watch flying up at 20 whatever thousand feet so the movie chose to focus on low-level flying, and it's just more fun to watch. And so uh, we'll we'll watch a little bit of it here, and we'll stop uh, next at the next scene. Yet you can't get a promotion. You won't retire. Despite your best efforts, you refuse to die. should be at least a two-star admiral by now. Yet here you are, Captain. The next scene here is the admiral essentially chewing out Tom Cruise and talking about why he's not an admiral at this point, why he's only a captain or an 06 officer rank, the sixth rank in officer, why he's still that. At his age, he should be an admiral, which is what the conversation is leading to here. So what causes that or why would that be? The movie portrays it like Tom Cruise is some kind of flunky or reject and that's the reason he doesn't get promoted. And there can be some truth to that, but for the most part, there's a definite two-track system within the officer corps. 
there are people who don't want to be admirals. Tom Cruise is certainly portrayed as one of those because the admiral position is much more talking. It's meetings. It's emails. It's all that stuff that has really very little to do with flying. And so a person has to decide whether they want to do that, what track they would like to pursue. And if you want to pursue more flying, more being out there, well, that's going to freeze your rank structure. It's going to limit your promotion. And that's obviously the kind of person we're dealing with here in the movie. We're dealing with a person who has not been wanting to choose that lifestyle. He wants to be out flying. And obviously has gotten in trouble along the way too. So there's certainly some of that going on. Um, how do the people like this speak to each other? In the movie, Tom Cruise is always getting chewed out. And again, reasonable. But people of this rank, an admiral, two-star admiral talking to a captain in this case, likely these two grew up together. Likely these two have known each other for 30 years, uh, maybe less, but a long time. They've met. They've talked to each other. They know each other's call signs. They may have even met their families. They could have a very long history together. So there's not always this yes, sir, no, sir, even though their rank structure is different in a typical conversation because they have been friends likely for very long. So it really depends on the people and who they know and what they've done along the way. When you're getting your butt chewed out by a higher ranking official, yeah, you're going to tend to stick with the yes, sir, no, sir. And that's pretty typical. But I just want to point out that that's not how people talk all the time. Why is that? It's one of life's mysteries, sir. So next, I think the movie does a good job also in just promoting what's going on in a carrier and promoting the life of not just the fighter pilot, but everything around them that is happening on a carrier deck. And so you've got the, the rock music, the, the jet noise, showing what's going on on a typical carrier launch early in the movie. That is pretty prevalent in the first Top Gun as well, and they have this feature in this movie, and I think you'll enjoy it. There's a lot of detail we could talk about, a lot of interaction with what's happening on a carrier deck, and so um, it's another just fun part of the movie that I think people enjoy. Here we have Tom Cruise in what appears to be a hangar, a personal hangar that he has with his own airplanes, etc. in the movie. And what I'd like to point out here is this whole row of patches, stuff going on here. Pretty typical in military aviation. We refer to these as zaps as well. These are stickers. These are representations of patches that you would have on your uniform. But they just have ad adhesive backing and they're put really anywhere anywhere that you want to have them. It's a sign of pride of the unit that you were in. And these zaps tend to get put in places in bars, on mirrors in bars, places in public that tend to, I guess, embrace the fighter pilot culture. Sometimes these zaps get put in places that they aren't intended to be and they're really put there and just a fun, I guess, poke at some folks or just showing squadron pride. In this case, this is just a sign of, of pride of all the different units that he's been in. Most likely, this is what this is meant to signify and the history that he's been through and just showing that he's done it a long time, really. You don't acquire that many zaps, that many squadron patches by being in for 10 years. This is a person who's been in it a long time. Okay, here we have a, <laughs> I stopped in a little bit of a unique spot there. I want to talk about singing in the bar. This is a scene where they are somewhat reenacting a scene from the first movie of singing this Great Balls of Fire song and there are people around singing and playing at the piano, etc. It looks fun. Um, this is a somewhat typical scene. Usually it's not a person playing the piano and people standing around singing. There are tons and tons of fighter pilot songs that have been passed down through the years that are sung in these venues. 
less and less this to this day, to be quite honest, because a lot of them have language and vulgarity and subject matters that just aren't fit for public consumption anymore. And that kind of that kind of talk, I guess, is going out of vogue. And these things are now sung most likely in squadron bars and only around people with a very limited audience, if at all. And even then, these songs are probably going out of vogue. So what they are signifying here and what they are showing is actually quite a typical scene, minus the piano. But singing songs in the bar is actually pretty fun, something you would likely do and probably is on its way out. But it is, again, one of those realistic things that you see in the movie that isn't too far from the truth, honestly. Folks, I want to draw your attention to a project that I'm very involved in that's called Counselors Can Help. It's my other main podcast. This show that I do currently is for fun, honestly. The other podcast is for um, what I've been involved in for a number of years. So I'm also a therapist. I've spent a lot of time recently becoming a therapist and getting licensed. And so the show, Counselors Can Help, was developed really from the idea of there's a lot of people not getting the help they need or really don't understand therapy they're afraid to come in, they've been stigmatized that there's something wrong with them and they just don't wanna have to deal with it. They don't wanna have to deal with these chronic problems that are happening and they just don't take part in the help they need. And so the show was developed to encourage people to come in to talk about what goes on in therapy. We talk about a lot of the typical anxiety, depression, conflict, conflict within your house, within your marriage, etc., And just spend a lot of time talking about things that I think people are interested in and are certainly a daily occurrence for a lot of folks, and really just taking the veil off of what is therapy and what goes on in there. So we try to do it in a very helpful and entertaining way, and I really invite you to go to Counselors Can Help or counselorscanhelp.com. Okay, we've got more low-level flying here, and I wanna highlight a couple of things. Now we're getting a view from inside the cockpit, which is an unusual view. Obviously, they have a camera probably located somewhere around or behind the ejection seat. And I just want to call your attention to a few things. So you can see there is some stuff inside here, some screens that all have various purposes. Right now, flying up this canyon, the pilot's eyes are everything up and around. There's nothing going on inside that is attracting the pilot's attention. It's all outside. Uh, to help the pilot, you have what's called the heads-up display. In this case, the F-18 is sitting right in front of the pilot. It includes all the essential gun sights, but way more information than that. It's information, in this case, for low-level flying, depicting where the airplane is going. There's a display on the screen that essentially points to if the pilot were to do nothing, that where is this pilot, where is the plane going? Where is the vector of the plane? So in this case, if there's a lot of stuff happening and you just want to be safe, you would, the pilot would aim and pull up to make sure the little symbol that's pointing to where the plane is going is in blue sky and there's nothing between him and blue sky. So that's an easy way to make sure you're not going to hit anything and it's a great tool. Also, there are are tools such as radar altimeter going off that's reading somewhere again on this HUD display, giving a constant readout of what the altitude is. So in this case, you have a probably a somewhat varying terrain and that altitude is changing constantly, much different than we saw in the initial picture of flying out on the desert floor and just having a flat bit of altitude. This is always changing. And so an aid to help the pilot from going too low is tied into the radar altimeter is some version of an altitude warning and that will start chirping at you and saying things like altitude altitude or you know any other version like that to get your attention that you've gone below the preset altitude that you've set on the radar altimeter so great tool and it's to keep you from hitting the ground obviously and at this point, everything is, the attention is outside. There's nothing going on in here that's capturing the pilot's attention. And there are many switches and things on the stick and throttle that we'll talk about down the line to keep the eyes of the pilot outside. Remember. 
I want to highlight this little quote here because I think it is very fitting and it's really a central idea of the show and that is the pilot is dying, the fighter pilot is dying, you're a dying relic, why do you keep doing this? And there's a little bit of a history behind this too. So we've been constantly told recently, pilots are constantly being told that we'll be replaced by computers. The computer is better, the computer, in this case, they even mentioned it in, in the movie, I believe, about how we don't have to worry about the pilot having to go into the bathroom and they can only stay up for so long. And there's a lot of human limitations to flying, that the computer would be better. And a, some of that is true, for sure, but there is a technological stop, I guess, that we've come up with, that we've hit, that is stopping a lot of progress, if you will, of pilotless planes. And the biggest thing that we just can't seem to get past is there's nothing like the human brain and eyes to be able to sense what's going on and make quick decisions. It's very difficult for a computer to sense what's really going on if it's a new environment, if things are changing very quickly. This requires a lot of sensors, a lot of computer power. And there's just a huge amount of technical challenges that we just can't get past at this point. You know, there are people that would say, well, no big deal. I mean, we can, there are planes fly all the time. We have drones right now. Why can't we have drones just be in every aircraft? Let's just put a computer in there and, and make it fly on its own. There are just a lot of technical challenges that don't lend themselves to wartime aviation. You can do it in peacetime. You can get away with it and you can do some um, experiments, I guess, with them. You can achieve some things with it. But when it comes to a dynamic environment and having to make decisions, which you will see in the movie, they have to make decisions very quickly. That type of flying is not suited to be able to be on the scene and making decisions and be essentially on your own. So we just don't have that kind of technology yet to put a computer in. So really the, the model that we'll likely see for a long time is a pilot with a lot of computer-aided technology. So there's a lot of good technology and aids and things like that that we get from the computer, but we just can't have the computer flying the plane totally yet and making decisions and flying in a dynamic environment it's just not possible yet. So a great scene, in this case, a great quote I'll play for you and just let it play so you can hear it. I, I chuckle every time I listen to it. The end is inevitable, Maverick. You kind of set it for extinction. Maybe so, sir. But not today. Your kind is headed for extinction, but not today. I love it. All right, so there's some, just a quick brief walk through one of the trailers of Top Gun. I hope you got something out of it. I enjoyed bringing it to you. What we want to do with this show is uh, do a few more of these, and then we'll eventually get to the movie down the line. You can see there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of things in there to celebrate the fighter pilot and get into some other areas that maybe you hadn't thought of. Uh, things that we will get into. We're going to talk about Gs and G-forces. They do spend some time in the movie doing that, so we'll spend a good bit of time here um, talking about what's all involved in that um, equipment things that you see culture in the bar being in the the clubs what's that like um what are you seeing in the movie is that close to reality call signs you're constantly hearing call signs um i think that is a very important part of the culture of the fighter pilot why we have call signs and how those are used the cockpit i've done a little bit of that uh showing you in the the low level flying what's going on there, what's being used, what's not being used. Um, another aspect that we'll be talking about is what are we thinking? What are we thinking about in certain areas of the movie, in these scenarios, just trying to bring you into the psyche, I guess, of what's going on inside um, the mind of a fighter pilot. The realism of aerial combat. You'll see realism galore I think in this movie but also there are some Hollywood things too but I want to mention what you're seeing that is pretty realistic and really getting into the aerial combat things that are much more exciting uh, I think you'll love it and I want to show you what part of that is typically done with that I would like to say goodbye for now please come back so we can talk about the realism of Top Gun and talk more about fighter pilots anonymous 